Okay. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Dr. Perry Carpenter. I'd like to thank you for taking the time to join me on this week's discussion. On this week's discussion, we're in session number eight of our fall Zoominar series. And today's session is entitled Truth and Lies in the Face-to-Face -face Evaluation. And in order to set the tone and set the stage for today's discussion, I wanna tell you a story. And the story relates to you as a qualified medical evaluator. And the philosophy of the story is how all the parties how all parties rely on truth and accuracy. And as relates to us as qualified medical evaluators, the parties rely on us for truth and accuracy in our opinions and conclusions. So I wanna to launch today's discussion by sharing with you a, a true story. And it's a story about uh, my experience as a homeowner and a property owner. <laughs> so about 10 years ago, uh, I moved to Placerville, California. And Placerville's in the foothills of the Sierra Nevadas. Many of you have probably been through Placerville on your way to Lake Tahoe or Reno, for example. And so uh, we bought a home and we bought 12 acres of land in Placerville, California. And no more than about a week after we moved into the property, uh, some problems started happening with the house. And we got ourselves, unfortunately, involved in a non-disclosure lawsuit with the sellers of the property. Well, if you've ever been in a lawsuit, you know that the process usually goes that you hire a lawyer and your lawyer uh, drafts some documents after extracting a sizable deposit from you. <laughs> then he drafts some documents and presents those documents to the other parties and you as the payers of this sequence of events, hope that you'll have a positive outcome, that the other side will see things in your favor and the matter will be resolved. Well, in this particular case, we waited for about 60 days for the parties to respond. And not only did the parties not respond in our favor, they ignored our contentions, didn't respond to our contentions and raised new contentions that only confounded the issue. And we realized at the time that, oh my God, this is gonna, this is gonna extend the matter another 90 days, six months. Oh my God, this is gonna cost another deposit. This is gonna cost another $10,000 in attorney's fees because of non-truthful and inaccurate reporting back from the other parties. Well, to make a long story short, this lawsuit went on for five full years, if you can believe that, five full years, and cost us over $100,000 in attorney's fees. We eventually prevailed on this, but had the opinions and conclusions been accurate to begin with, we could have avoided that whole nightmare during which my wife and I aged 35 dog years, not just human years. So what does this have to do with you as a QME? Well, I want you to imagine this scenario. Imagine that the examinee has come to you for a qualified medical evaluation. They've completed the evaluation. Imagine the hope and expectancy that the examinee has. Imagine the hope and expectancy that the claims administrator has, the defense attorney has, the applicant attorney has. All of the parties eagerly and anxiously await your report, wondering what the QME gonna say? What's the QME say? What does the QME say? They all have tremendous hope and expectancy that your report is gonna resolve the issue for them, for them. Okay, so they wait with hope and expectancy. So, what is your responsibility? What is your obligation as a qualified medical evaluator? Your obligation as a qualified medical evaluator is to provide opinions and conclusions that are truthful and accurate. Truthful and accurate. Now I had a phone call yesterday from a qualified medical evaluator and he was telling me about all the problems and worries 
that he was having. And he was talking about, he was asking me about how to fashion his opinions and conclusions such that his friends, applicant attorneys, his friends who are applicant attorneys could make more money. This is what he was telling me. And he was telling me that, you know, the applicant attorneys, they're not making that much money. And so how can we do our reports so that they can make more money? And I asked him, what does the applicant attorney's situation have to do with your opinions and conclusion? They have nothing to do with your opinions and conclusions. Your obligation is not to be applicant oriented. Your obligation is not to be defense oriented. Your, your obligation is to be accuracy oriented. It's only when you provide opinions and conclusions that are accurate that you can sleep well at night. And I, had, I have a doctor, a client who had a deposition today and he went to the deposition cool, calm, and comfortable and relaxed and not worried, not sweaty, not anxious because he provided opinions and conclusions that he felt comfortable were an accurate representation of the examinee's true condition. So as qualified medical evaluators, well, let the George have say so over everything. We need all parties to uh, mute, and I'll I'll handle the mute here. Okay, so it's essential that we obtain accurate and truthful testimony and facts from our examinee regarding the history of injury, regarding the relevant medical history, regarding any limitations to activities of daily living, regarding their true and accurate participation in physical examination findings. If we can obtain true and accurate facts, then we as qualified medical evaluators can provide true and accurate opinions and conclusions in our causation AOE COE section of our report. We can provide true, accurate, permanent impairment uh, ratings. We can provide true and accurate apportionment approximate percentages. And we can provide true and accurate description of the need for future medical care. It allows us to, uh, to opine truthfully and accurately on any need or lack of need for disability, temporary disability, total disability, or any work restrictions. So it's essential in providing true and accurate opinions in our conclusions that we rely on true and accurate data. Now, I wanna talk about the specific subset of all of these today. I wanna to talk about how to obtain true and accurate testimony from the examinee in the history of injury section of your report for those cases that involve AOE, COE determinations by you, particularly re referring to the denied claim under Labor Code 4060. But the principles that I want to share with you today about how to obtain true and accurate information relates to all the sections of your report, but we'll, we'll illustrate these principles and exemplify these principles by focusing in on your AOE, COE determination. Okay, so here I wanna provide you with uh, some tools that you can use and that you can rely on in arriving at true and accurate um, opinions and conclusions in the AOE and COE sections of your report. So I wanna give you a couple of tools that you can rely on. The first tool that we'll talk about is the problem of fraud in compensation claims. Now notice, I don't refer here to workers' compensation claims. I'm referring to all compensation claims. So this applies to disability, uh, social security disability claims, personal injury claims, veterans administration claims, workers' compensation claims. Okay, compensation claims, you'll admit, and you've experienced that there's a component or there's the potential for fraud. And you need to be aware of this and you need to be comfortable with it as you sit with your examinee who attempts to convince you that they suffered an on-the-job injury, okay? So I'll share some references with you from the guides. Uh, we'll talk about uh, an interesting concept called false imputation. And uh, I'll share with you uh, what a 2017 RAND study has to say about fraud in California workers' compensation. 
Next, the next tool that you'll use when it comes time for you to provide an accurate opinion or conclusion in the AOE, COE section of your report has to do with the burden of proof for establishing industrial injury. And there's three laws, three labor codes that tell us upon who, upon which party does the burden of proof for establishing industrial injury fall? Now, I'll give you a little bit of advance heads up on it. Guess who the burden falls upon? Does the burden for establishing industrial injury fall upon the qualified medical evaluator? <laughs> it does not. And many times qualified medical evaluators assume the burden for proving the presence or the absence of industrial injury. When in actuality, the burden for proving or establishing industrial injury falls upon the examinee. So if you know this, if you know this in advance, this will help you. This will help you to be able to extract from the examinee the information necessary to provide the proper opinion on AOE and COE. And the third tool I wanna to share with you, there are more tools, but uh, we will only have time for the first three today. The third tool I wanna to share with you has to deal with your interview of the examinee and an interview technique known or becoming increasingly known, especially in the insurance claims setting, like the settings that we're involved in, is referred to as the verifiability of details. So once you understand that there is a problem of fraud in workers' compensation, once you understand who holds the burden of proof for establishing industrial injury, knowing those concepts and then applying the verifiability of details approach in your interviewing of your examinee can allow you to get the necessary facts, the necessary data upon which to truthfully and accurately opine either for industrial injury or against industrial injury, okay? So let's begin and let's explore a couple of concepts related to fraud in compensation claims. So tool number one for you is to understand and be comfortable with the potential, the potential for fraud in workers' compensation claims. And I speak with qualified medical evaluators all the time and they tell me about examinees that they just um, didn't believe. And I hear this from qualified medical evaluators of all specialties in all parts of the state. We all have these same experiences that we're encountering examinees that are not that credible. Now, this is not all examinees. This is just a subset of examinees. There are just as many examinees who are fully credible and are fully uh, qualified for workers' compensation benefits. I'm talking about those that subset of cases where there's a denied claim, where we are called upon to render an opinion on AOE and COE. And what kind of claims get denied in the first place? Have you ever thought about this? What kind of claims get denied? It's the red flag claims that get denied, correct? It's not the, it's not the bona fide witnessed incident of industrial injury that required an ambulance and was witnessed by the owner of the company. Those types of claims don't get denied. It's the suspicious red flag claims that get denied. And these are the claims that have the potential for fraud. So let's talk about it. Fraud, the denied claim, and the Labor Code 4060 evaluation. And let's see what the AMA guys has to say uh, about this idea. So if you have your AMA guides, maybe you'll want to read this uh, at the end of our discussion. The AMA guides are fascinating. In, uh, there's 18 chapters in the AMA guides. And chapter 18 is the last chapter in the book. And the last section of chapter 18 is section 18.7, okay? So think about this. In the last section of the last chapter of the book, after the authors have spent 18 chapters teaching us how to perform permanent impairment evaluations, they tell us one more thing. <laughs> <laughs> they tell us one more thing. Before you go out and actually embark 
on doing your permanent impairment evaluations, there's just one little thing you should be aware of. <laughs> and they put it in the last section of the last chapter of the book. And here it is, it's entitled malingering. So before we go out and do our permanent impairment evaluations, we should just be aware of this one little concept. And they tell us in the AMA guides that malingering is the conscious deception for the purpose of gain. Two key words here, it's conscious, it's conscious, it's willful, it's intentional, it's deliberate, and there's the potential for gain. Now in California workers' compensation, is there the potential for gain? There is, there's the potential for gain, isn't there? So it's possible that there's the potential for uh, malingering in California workers' compensation. They go on and they tell us, while most authorities declare that malingering is quite uncommon, there appear to be a few data regarding the frequency of malingering, but they do provide us three studies that talk about how frequently malingering may be. So they tell us that Fishbane and his group, they reviewed literature suggesting that malingering is present in somewhere between one and 10% of individuals who are complaining of chronic pain, such as our examinees in California workers' compensation. I would suggest that it's higher than 10%, but this is what Fishbane quotes. Next study, other fields provide some limits regarding the prevalence of malingering in one study, get this now, one study, they studied individuals who were reporting to the emergency room complaining of intractable diarrhea, okay? 14% of those persons had positive stool examinations for laxatives, although every single one of them denied the use of laxatives. Okay, so now imagine this. You're an emergency room doctor and these people are coming in telling you, I have diarrhea, I have diarrhea. I don't know what's the cause of my diarrhea, but I've got diarrhea and it's intractable. It's not responding to anything. And the doctor says, well, that's quite, quite unusual. Doctor says, are you lactose intolerant? No. Are you gluten intolerant? No. Do you have food allergies? Did you eat some tainted cottage cheese? And the doctor goes through this entire history, including, have you used any laxatives in the last 24 to 48 hours? And every single person responded that they had not used laxatives. And yet, by stool sample, 14% of them tested positive for stool samples, and they're now presenting to the hospital emergency room for a physical complaint caused by their own voluntary use of laxatives. Now, we could ask ourselves all day long, why in the world would people do this? Well, we could speculate on that all day long. The important point for us is that people do do this. We just need to understand that people do do this, okay? Next study, 333 people, and this is a compensation claim. This is a compensation claim. 330 people who claimed compensation for noise-induced hearing loss. They worked at airports and in busy factories and all that stuff. The incidence of exaggeration on hearing tests was 17.7%. So they put a tone in these people's ears and they said, you know, just respond with a thumbs up when you hear the tone. And they put the tone in the ear and the examinee sat there, nope, nope, don't hear the tone, nope. They said, do you hear the tone now? Nope, nope, don't hear the tone. And yet by an objective test, cortical evoked response audiometry, an objective test, versus the subjective, nope, nope, thumbs up, thumbs down, subjective test. With an objective test, they proved that the signal had reached the auditory cortex in the brain and that therefore the examinee must have heard the stimulus. They claimed it was 17%, okay? Now, even more profound than that is a study by Weintraub. Weintraub tells us that based on his studies, 20 to 46% of people, could we say that 46% of people is rounded up to 50? Could we call that 50? 
If it's 50, that's one in two. That's every other. That's every other person. I submit that it might be even higher, but Weintraub says that one in every two people consider purposeful misrepresentation of compensation claims to be acceptable behavior. You just have to know this. We don't pass judgment on it. We don't have to explain why this could be. You just have to understand that when you're involved in a compensation claim, it somehow becomes socially acceptable to employ a little hyperbole when it comes to describing your condition. You just have to know this, you have to be comfortable with it, and you just have to work with it. And you still have to come out of the other end with true and accurate opinions and conclusions. Now, I've spoken to many, many qualified medical evaluators, and I'll speak to you today. And I'll bet if I spoke to you about malingering, you would tell me, you would tell me that, hey, Perry, I know, I know, I know when someone's malingering. I can tell. I can tell when someone's malingering. And you know what? We all, we all are pretty good at detecting examinees who are malingering. But I submit to you that what you're encountering more in your workers' compensation evaluations is not malingering, but it's actually something different. It's known as false imputation. So let's compare false imputation with malingering, and you're going to see how this fits many of the examinees that you see. So again, my name is Susana, and I invite you to visit Pusca Muting. So back to malingering. So malingering is the intentional or conscious production of false or grossly exaggerated physical or psychological symptoms. It's motivated by an external incentive, many of which are operative in California workers' compensation, such as what? Such as avoiding work, such as obtaining drugs, such as obtaining financial compensation. Are any of these incentives operative in California workers' compensation? They are. They are, aren't they? So that's malingering. So what's important about malingering is that the symptoms are false. That's why we can detect malingerers, because malingerers don't know what we as doctors know about how certain physical conditions affect the body, how they affect activities of daily living, how they affect the exam. Malingering is quite easy to detect, and you will tell me that you can always detect a malingerer. But what you're encountering more often than malingering is examinees who are employing false imputation. With false imputation, false imputation involves attributing a bona fide symptom, a bona fide physical finding, a bona fide medical condition to an alternative cause. They're imputing falsely a bona fide condition to a false cause, such as an injury at work. So with false imputation, you will, you will tell me, if I interviewed you about the examinee, you will tell me, Perry, Perry, this examinee was very credible. This examinee was very sincere. I believed the examinee, and I hear this all the time. <laughs> and the reason that these examinees are believable is that and the reason that they're sincere is because they're testifying to you about an actual condition that they actually have. So they can tell you how their symptoms feel, how their symptoms affect them. They can testify truthfully about their activities of daily living and you won't suspect malingering at all. But remember when providing a true and accurate opinion on your AOE COE determination, the critical issue is what's the cause of this condition, not is there a condition, it's is what is the cause of the condition? Is there industrial causation? So you're going to be examining examinees that have pathology. Pathology does not equal causation. So when the examinee says, I hurt my knee at work, many qualified medical evaluators will examine the knee, they'll find a bona fide condition with the knee, 
And they'll conclude that because there's a bona fide condition, that equals industrial causation. But that's not the sequence. The sequence is to investigate the cause, and that's what we're going to get to next. So you need to be aware of false imputation. You're going to be examining examinees who have bona fide conditions. Don't be confused or confounded by the presence of a bona fide condition. You need to take it further and investigate an accurate uh, opinion on AOE and COE. So that's tool number one, is just knowing that this happens and that you're going to be at exam uh, with examinees that have an external incentive for gain, okay? It's said, it's said that when an examinee comes to the qualified medical evaluation, okay, let's think about this. The examinee schedules the morning off to come to your evaluation. They maybe arrange for childcare or take the morning off work. They get up, they shower, they shave, they dress, they put on makeup, they travel to your evaluation, they fill out your paperwork, they sit with you, they commit to the evaluation. When, a, when an examinee comes to the evaluation, they're coming to the evaluation to convince you of something. <laughs> they're coming to convince you of something. Your job is to determine what that something is. And there is a population of examinees who will come to you with a bona fide condition and will attempt to convince you to provide an inaccurate opinion that that condition was caused by the workplace exposure. You just need to know this, okay? Now the next tool, and we're gonna scoot by the RAND study in the interest of time. The next tool, I want to share with you has to do with understanding the burden of proof in establishing an industrial injury. Now there's three laws, Labor Code 3600, 3205.5, and 5705 that tell us upon whose shoulders does the burden for establishing industrial injury lie. Now this is a fascinating concept. We're going to be getting denied claims and if you look back on your roster of QME evaluations you'll see that about 60% of your evaluations that you do involve a dispute over compensability under Labor Code 4060. The other 40% is divided up amongst all the other disputes like permanent impairment, apportionment, need for future medical care. All those other disputes only make up about 40% of all disputes. The bulk of the disputes involve the compensability dispute. So those come to us as denied claims. Now, imagine you're the claims administrator and in comes a new claim form. <laughs> That's how a claim gets started, right? Somebody fills out a claim form. So here comes a claim form, right? Across your desk, along with the other 40 for the day, right? So what is the system that the claims administrator uses to determine, hey, am I gonna accept this claim? Is this an accepted claim? Or is this a claim that I'm going to deny? What's the system? What's the system? The system is very simple. <laughs> the claims administrator simply asks him or herself one question. Can the employee prove it? <laughs> if the answer to that question is no, out comes the denied stamp. That's the filter through which these claims go to become either accepted claims or denied claims. The claims administrator knows that the burden of proof as established by these three laws, the burden is on the examinee and they simply look at the facts of the case and they ask themselves, can the examinee prove it? If the answer is no, it becomes a denied claim. That's why so many of these come to us as denied claims because the claims administrator knows that the examinee has no way to be able to prove it. That doesn't mean that the examinee didn't suffer an industrial injury. They could actually have suffered an industrial injury, but if they can't prove it, shuck so darn, it is the law, or it is three laws actually. So let's go through these very quickly so that you become uh, impressed by what the law has to say about the burden of proof. Labor Code 3600 tells us that the employee, that the employee must demonstrate by a preponderance of evidence 
th this one relates to post-employment, Clint. It tells us that no compensation shall be paid. No compensation shall be paid unless the employee demonstrates by a preponderance of the evidence. What is the preponderance of the evidence? Part of the preponderance of the evidence has to do with your evaluation, your QME evaluation becomes evidence that they provide to help support their claim for industrial injury. So that constitutes part of their preponderance. Now they're gonna come to us as qualified medical evaluators with their verbal subjective preponderance as well in an attempt to convince us to opine for them. So you need to be acutely attuned and acutely aware to what is the preponderance that they're bringing, explaining, telling, claiming. What is their preponderance? Because the burden is on them. Labor Code 3202.5 tells us that all parties and lien claimants shall meet the evidentiary burden of proof on all issues by a preponderance of the evidence. So what this basically is telling us that the party who holds the affirmative of the issue, this is legal terms, but I'm gonna explain it in doctor terms. The party that holds the affirmative of the issue is the party who's making the claim, All right? When I bought my property in Placerville, I claimed that they fraudulated the water production report from the well, that was my claim. And it became my obligation to be able to prove that. It was my evidentiary burden to prove that. Well, in workers' compensation, the party holding the affirmative of the issue has the burden of proving the issue. So it's the employee or the examinee who's claiming industrial injury. The examinee, therefore, has the burden of proving by a preponderance of the evidence the presence of an industrial injury. So the claims administrator just looks at it and looks at their preponderance of evidence. What evidence does the examinee have of an industrial injury? And typically the evidence is not sufficient to cause the claims administrator to accept the claim. Are you following me? Okay, finally, 5705 tells us that the burden of proof rests upon the party holding the affirmative of the issue. Okay, so we already talked about that. So just as an example to illustrate that, these are some of the affirmative defenses. Affirmative defenses are described under Labor Code 3600, defenses for which the employer is not liable for benefits, okay? So this talks about some of the affirmative defenses, the burden of, of which rests upon the employer. So these are defenses that, hey, we're not responsible for this industrial injury, if the employer can prove intoxication, if the employer can prove was willful misconduct and all of these things, the point is, the point is that the party holding the affirmative of the issue has the burden of proof for establishing that issue. And that's why these examinees come to us for a qualified medical evaluation. So there's tool number two. First is understanding that we're going to be getting red flag cases. Number two, understanding that it's up to the employee to prove their injury. So where do we go from here? Well, the examinee is going to come to us, these qualified medical evaluators, to convince us that they suffered an industrial injury so that we will opine for them and, and allow them to receive workers' compensation benefits. Now, this works for both sincere examinees and this works for insincere examinees because for both populations of examinees, we as qualified medical evaluators wanna provide the actual, true, proper opinion and conclusion. A wrong opinion and conclusion harms one or more of the parties, always, always. The last thing we want to do certainly is to harm the examinee with the wrong opinion. We don't want to harm the claims administrator and make the claims administrator pay unnecessarily for an industrial injury that didn't occur. It's critical that we provide opinions and conclusions that are accurate. So now what I want to share with you is how you can get accurate information regarding the industrial injury from your examinee. And this is your third tool in your toolkit for arriving at true and accurate opinions on AOE-COE. 
And this is the tool of understanding the examinee's communication strategy. The examinee is coming to the evaluation to convince you of something, okay? Your job is to determine what is that something, okay? So you have to understand that the examinee is coming with a communication strategy. So what I wanna share with you is some ways that you can identify what is their communication strategy by sharing with you several studies on a topic known as the verifiability approach. So I've provided all of these studies for you in your course materials today. And we're gonna take one of these here, the top one, Exploring Liars Verbal Strategies and, and extract some citations from it that apply specifically to the work that we do. I also wanna encourage you to read this one here, the second one, Applying the Verifiability Approach to Insurance Claims Settings. This is what we're involved in. We're involved in insurance claims settings. So this approach is now being applied to insurance claim settings to determine did, 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 the person, did the person actually drop his phone, which is covered under warranty, or did he give it away to his stepbrother? <laughs> okay, this is just an example, and that example is cited uh, in this study. So let's take a look here at Exploiting Liars Verbal Strategies. This is a study uh, published in the Journal of Legal and Criminologic Psychology, September 2014. And some of the other studies that I provided for you uh, are more current than this one. But this is the one that started this whole concept and the momentum behind this interviewing strategy known as the verifiability approach. So in this study, they tell us that distinguishing truth from lies is a difficult task. It's difficult to tell the difference between truth and lies. And you may say to yourself, well, I can tell when someone's given me a line. <laughs> You'll say that. Or I can tell when someone's given me, you know, a line of bull, bunch of bull. Well, guess what? You may think you know, but it's actually very, very difficult. The study tells us that reviews of more than 100 deception experiments have shown that nonverbal and verbal cues to deceit are typically faint and unreliable. Now, we have this sense as a population and as a people that we can tell when people are lying, particularly nonverbally, right? So think in your mind about how someone who is lying presents to you nonverbally, they're, they're fidgety, uh, they won't look you straight in the eye. They seem anxious. They may be sweating or breathing rapidly. These nonverbal cues. Well, guess what? Studies show that nonverbal cues to deceit are faint and unreliable. So just because someone does not look you in the eye does not mean that they're not being truthful. These cues are faint and unreliable. And I was at an applicant attorney seminar about a month ago. And there was a judge on the panel and the judge was telling us all in the audience about how he can tell when an examinee employee is a malingerer or a liar. And he said, he said, you know, I've been at this so many years, I can tell. I mean, you can just tell. He said, you can just tell. And I was thinking to myself, no, you can't. You cannot because the cues are typically faint and unreliable. So how can we tell? How can we tell who's telling us the truth compared to who's may not be telling the whole truth? Well, one explanation as to why cues to deceit are faint and unreliable, and this is fascinating for us as qualified medical evaluators, is that liars cannot take their credibility for granted. See, a truth teller, a truth teller takes his credibility for granted. They don't have to perform anyway. They're just telling the truth. They're just telling you what happened. They're just telling it like it is. They take for granted. Their communication strategy is to take for granted that they're telling the truth. But liars cannot take their credibility for granted. And therefore, they have to attempt to make an honest impression. They have to do some things non-verbally. They have to say some things verbally. 
in order to make an honest impression. And if we can understand that these two populations have different communication strategies, we can exploit these strategies and open up a gap. See my hands? See my hands? Truth tellers and liars, when they tell their stories, it's hard to tell between them. But if we can exploit their communication strategy, we can open up a gap and we can widen the gap between the two so it becomes easier to distinguish. Okay, this is a truthful statement and this is a deceptive statement. We have to open up a gap between the two of them so that we can identify who's who and the verifiability approach allows us to open up such a gap. So here's, here's some uh, description of the different communication strategies. Liars control their nonverbal behavior and their verbal speech, and they attempt to display behaviors and say things, see that's nonverbal and verbal, that they believe give an honest impression. And they avoid behaviors and speech that they believe raise suspicion. When they succeed in their attempts, and you, you've, you've, you know people who you would call good liars, right? They're good liars. When they succeed in their attempts, it blurs the behavioral and speech differences between liars and truth tellers, and consequently decreases the ability to distinguish between them. So they control their behavior, they control their speech. And if we understand this, we can exploit this strategy. We can make use of their strategy, their communication strategy, their attempt to make an honest impression to discover the actual truth, whether an industrial injury actually occurred or whether an industrial injury did not occur, okay? So here's the liar strategy and here's the take home principle on this verifiability approach. Liars are inclined to mention sufficient details of their story, of their injury to provide a convincing account, even though it's a false account. It's a convincing false account. Now, it's known that if you survey the public, the public will tell you, and you'll even confirm this, that the believability of a story is based upon how rich in detail is that story, okay? So imagine your 17-year-old daughter comes home from uh, comes home late on a Wednesday night. She's supposed to be home at 8.45. She comes in at 12.15 and you uh, meet her in the hallway and she says, and you ask her, uh, where have you been? And she tells you a long story full of details. Well, we got a flat tire on Route 49 right at the intersection of Mississippi Drive. And uh, Becky came along. She was in her dad's uh, old Impala but fortunately, uh, she had a spare tire. And then after we got it changed, we went to the Dairy Queen. They were open late. I had a strawberry fizz. Becky had a banana split. And it's rich with details. The believability of a story is based upon how rich that story is in details. So liars are inclined to mention sufficient details to give a convincing, even though it's a false account. And the other side of their strategy is to avoid mentioning details that could potentially be verified by the interviewer. So your 16 year old daughter comes in and says, um, uh, Becky came by in her dad's old Impala when you as the dad know, know that the Impala was sold two years ago. That's a detail that could be verified. You could call up the father of Becky and say, did Becky have the Impala last night? That's a detail that even though the father may not take the time, effort, or energy to verify that detail, it's a detail that could potentially, could potentially be verified, okay? So liars try to avoid mentioning details that could be potentially verified by the interviewer. So, why do they do that? They do that for fear that the interviewer will actually go out and try to verify the truth or falsehood of those details. So liars walk this tightrope. They walk a tightrope. They have to provide enough details to create a convincing account 
but they have to avoid mentioning details that could be specifically verified by the interviewer, by the examiner. So they walk a tightrope. So as a solution to these two ends of the spectrum, they provide many details. They'll provide you a story full of details, but you'll find through an analysis of the details that none of the details can be verified. They're non-verifiable details. This is called the verifiability approach to distinguishing between truthful stories and deceitful stories. Well, what does this have to do with us as qualified medical evaluators? Well, let's apply this to the work that we do and let's determine what qualifies as a verifiable detail and what qualifies as a detail that cannot be verified. So a verifiable detail is a detail that describes an activity with an identifiable person. Mrs. Jones, Mrs. Jones, who were you working with at the time of the injury? Uh, I was working, I was working, I was working with my coworker and my uh, supervisor. Okay, so what's the name of the coworker? Uh, you know, I, we use, just usually call that person Butch. We call that person Butch. Uh, what's the name of the supervisor? Uh, you know, I never did know that person's name. And this is a detail that cannot be verified. Now, a different story than that, a verifiable detail is I was with John Smith, my coworker, and right along the right side of me was Carlos Alvarez, my immediate supervisor. They were both there. They both witnessed this incident. And here, here is their statement to such an effect. That's a detail that can be verified, okay? This is what examinees bring to us. Number two, the detail describes an activity that has been witnessed by anyone. Why you just shot someone, right? Yes. And you told him he had a gun. I, at the time I was a little dazed, I was thinking of Mr. Zabinski with the pistol he had at the Duramax. Okay, back to unmuting. The detail describes an activity that has been witnessed by an identifiable person. Mrs. Jones, when you hurt yourself, was the injury witnessed by anyone? Do you have a statement from the witness? Now, examinees will tell you that, yeah, was it witnessed by my coworker? It was witnessed by my coworker. Is that a detail that can be verified? Remember, the burden of proof falls on the examinee, on the injured person. An injured person attempting to prove their industrial injury will bring to you a witness statement. In the absence of a witness statement, the detail cannot be verified. A witness, witness statement, which I've had cases that involve witness statements, witness statement is a very powerful corroborator of an industrial injury because it's a detail that's verified. It's a it's the box on the verifiability box is checked. It's a detail that's verified. Further, the detail describes an activity that may have been documented or recorded through technology. Mrs. Jones, do you have uh do you have well what do you have, Mrs. Jones? Do you have any photos? Do you have any recordings? Do you got any videos? Do you have any Post-it notes, emails, text messages. What do you have, Mrs. Jones? What do you have that's a detail that verifies that you suffered an industrial injury? Examinees will tell you, well, there's cameras all around. There's cameras all around. You could get the cameras. Remember, the burden of proof for establishing an industrial injury falls upon the examinee. Now, in that case, you may opine against an industrial injury because there's no proof the examinee may go out and take their own initiative and get those video recordings. If there are actual video recordings, if they get those actual video recordings and they bring them to you or they get introduced into evidence, then you can change your opinion based upon the new evidence that verifies the detail of the industrial injury. But absence, the proof from the person who holds the burden of proof as a qualified medical evaluator, you cannot provide an opinion for industrial injury and have that opinion be accurate because it's not based on any verifiable or accurate fact, okay? 
So what are some more examples? Well, how about this in terms of obtaining verifiable detail from your examinee? Mrs. Jones, I would like for you to tell me how the injury occurred and I'd like to have you give me as many details as you can remember. Now, I want you to know that I'm gonna be checking to verify the accuracy of these details. I'm gonna be checking to verify the accuracy of these details. So I want you to provide me with as many details as you can remember and details that I can verify. Now, what you're gonna find is that a true and accurate story that actually occurred, an industrial injury that accurate, actually occurred, will have more details that can be verified than a false account. The reason the details cannot be verified on a false account is because the account never happened and it doesn't have associated with it details that can be verified. Are you getting it? The examinee says, uh, I hurt myself at 4.45 in the morning uh, before anyone comes in. That's before anybody gets there. And uh, I, uh, I put a post-it note, I put a post-it note on my supervisor's desk. Do you have a copy of the post-it note or is that a detail that cannot be verified? I slipped off the curb at 445. Is that a detail that can be verified? You're gonna find that truthful accounts have more details that can be verified compared to false accounts. This is called the verifiability of details approach. So this is something that would relate to a specific incident of in industrial injury and you're looking for the details that can be verified or cannot be verified. So as an aside here, and we're going to we're going to conclude in about 4 minutes as an aside. You've seen those um, you've seen those police interrogation shows on TV where uh, two people are in a dark room and the police interrogator is interviewing the perpetrator. And did you know that the purpose of that interrogation, the purpose of that interrogation is to obtain a transcript. Okay? The interviewer is not is not listening and responding to the questions and answers from the perpetrator at that time. The purpose of that interview is to obtain a transcript. And then they have coders and scorers that review the transcript and they code and score the transcript for the specific features of truthful versus deceitful testimony. One of those features is the verifiability of details. So as you take your examinee's testimony down, you're not necessarily scrutinizing the detail. You're simply asking yourself, is this a detail that can be verified? I put a post-it note on my desk, on my boss's desk. Is a detail that has no potential to be verified. So you're simply looking at how many details can be verified compared to those that cannot be verified. For cumulative trauma injury, Mrs. Jones, Please describe in as much detail as possible how you develop the symptoms that you ascribe to a cumulative trauma injury with ABC employer. Deceitful examinees are inclined to mention sufficient details that will be a, provide a convincing but false account. Liars will avoid mentioning those details that could potentially be verified. And so you'll find that these examinees flood you with details, but on close scrutiny, those details are not any details that could be verified. And this is how you can gain an understanding as to the credibility of your examinee in the context and in the environment where many examinees uh, are less than sincere and are claiming industrial injury when in actuality, no industrial injury actually occurred. So your toolbox, the QME toolbox for providing accurate opinions and conclusions in this example on AOE and COE is number one, understanding the nature of compensation claims in that uh, about 50% of people consider it okay to misrepresent their condition on compensation claims. Number two, understand that the burden of proof for establishing industrial injury is on the examinee and then number three, using the verifiability approach in obtaining the medical history. Now, 
I'll tell you a story and then we'll conclude. I once had an examinee who was treating under workers' compensation for a lower back injury. And he went to a medical appointment and after he left the medical appointment, he suffered a rear end impact on the freeway and he claimed a neck injury, which would be compensable against the industrial injury because he was just leaving his treatment for the industrial injury. Well, he came to me and he reported this to me and he told me all about the rear end impact and all about his treatment at the ER and all about what happened, none of which was verifiable through the medical records. There were no medical records. He had no accident report. He had no towing report. He had no ER treatment notes. There was nothing that could be verified. So I opined against industrial cervical spine injury due to a rear impact auto collision. Guess what he did? <laughs> he got pissed and he went out and he got the ED notes. And he got the follow-up treatment visits for his cervical spine. And he got those details, those verifiable details entered into the record, at which point I reversed my opinion because I was provided with new and verifiable details. So as a qualified medical evaluator, take-home principle, in order to provide accurate opinions and conclusions, you have to provide opinions and conclusions based on accurate facts absent accurate facts, you're not going to feel happy being at deposition defending your opinion and conclusion if it's not based on accurate facts. And the verifiability approach is one way that you can obtain accurate facts at least relates to the AOE and COE determination. And I hope this helps all of you uh, with your very next evaluation. And I look forward to being with you on our next Zoom session. As we conclude today, does anyone have any comment or contribution regarding this discussion? I do, this is Dr. Monahan. Um, it's my impression that I cannot look at any information unless it was presented by the attorneys. So if they bring information in, I can't look at it. Is that true? That's true, or you're at risk if you do. Okay. So I just, like I've done that before. The attorneys do not send the personnel records. So I can't verify anything. So I have to say, you know, you need to send the records and I'll give a different opinion. And I go in favor of the applicant when the attorneys are saying one thing. So then later on, they send the personnel records for me to follow up. So just remember that the burden of proof is on the examinee. So it would seem that the burden of proof of providing the personnel records, if there's something in the personnel records that are gonna support the examinee's claim for industrial injury, there's something there, some nugget of fact that supports the claim. Yes, that should be that should be the job of the applicant attorney to get that to you. And it's Absolutely. interesting; they very seldom do until I request it. <laughs> right, the burden of proof for establishing industrial injury falls on the examinee and on the applicant attorney. And my suggestion is that you don't assume the burden; simply opine on the basis of the facts that you have, and then. Right. If then if the parties present you with those facts, hey, hey, now you have new information. And it's easy to change your opinion when you have new information. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's, that's a winner, winner, chicken dinner. When you don't, when you're not presented with new information, never, never, never change your opinion. It's only new information that will allow you to change your opinion. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Does, uh, does the verifiability approach uh, seem to the parties uh, in attendance here something that you could employ in your evaluation? Yes. Like how? <laughs> I'm gonna ask questions in a different way. And 
so because sometimes they give me fuzzy answers. I'm, I'm psychology for the people that don't know. So I have, and I, I kind of do this, but I'm going to change how I ask some of the questions because a lot of people are depressed and anxious and they've been depressed and anxious before they start the job. So I have asked questions about supervisors. Uh, it's in the records that verify what they say. But yeah, I'm going to change how I ask some questions. Always looking for details that can be verified. In the absence of details that can be verified, all you're left with is subjective testimony. Subjective testimony. And when you provide opinions and conclusions, you want to have relevant facts upon which your opinions and conclusions are based. And the examinee's testimony does not qualify as relevant facts. Yes. So always put the burden on the examinee for coming up with relevant facts if there's not relevant facts in the record. And guess what? Guess what? Do you think it's possible that the insurance claims administrator could pull out of the documents facts that would support the industrial injury? Of course it does. Of course that happens. It happens all the time. But what can we do as qualified medical evaluators? We can only opine based on the facts that we have. If there's something missing, that's not our job. That's not our job. That's the job of the applicant attorney, right? Yes. Comments, suggestions, ideas? Does anyone have a, another idea as to a technique that they might use to, uh, you know, get truthful testimony from the examinee? I was uh, with a qualified medical evaluator yesterday and she told me, she told me several times, Perry, I believed her. Perry, I believed her. And I asked her, on, on what basis did you believe her? And she just told me, well, you know, I can just tell. I've been at this a long time and I can tell. I can tell when people are telling me the truth and when people are not. And what she was saying was, my interpretation was that she was saying that she considered that the examinee testified credibly about her condition, about her condition, which is different than testifying about industrial causation. <laughs> okay, if there's no further questions or comments, I want to thank you all for joining me. I look forward to being with you on our next session and best of luck in your career as a qualified medical evaluator. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. I know. Thank you.